In the late 1960s, American authorities encountered a formidable criminal force for the first time in Honolulu, Hawaii. This new breed of criminal, adorned with tattoos and often missing fingers, was unlike anything they had faced before. The Yakuza, a deeply entrenched criminal organization from Japan, had expanded its reach to American shores, operating on an unprecedented scale in terms of both size and scope of activities. At that time, while American Mafia organizations counted around 20,000 members, Japan boasted over 180,000 Yakuza members, despite its smaller population. This stark contrast raised alarm bells in the United States, prompting authorities to take action against this formidable criminal power. Attempts were made to gather intelligence on the Yakuza from Japanese authorities, but cooperation was limited. Unlike the adversarial relationship between American law enforcement and the Mafia, the Yakuza had long established connections with Japanese police and even enjoyed a degree of societal acceptance. Some Yakuza groups openly displayed their affiliation, with symbols proudly adorning their headquarters. The Yakuza's modus operandi further bewildered American authorities. Rather than shrouding their activities in secrecy, some Yakuza held press conferences following violent incidents, demonstrating a brazenness unheard of in organized crime elsewhere. Understanding the Yakuza requires delving into their complex history. Initially shrouded in secrecy, the Yakuza has evolved into a recognized entity with deep roots in Japanese society. Despite the challenges faced by American authorities in combating this formidable criminal organization, the Yakuza's unique characteristics and societal integration continue to set them apart from other criminal syndicates around the world. The origins of the Yakuza remain shrouded in mystery, with four competing theories tracing their roots back to feudal Japan, spanning the 17th to 19th centuries. One theory suggests they emerged from the Kabukimano, descendants of fallen samurai, known for their eccentricities and criminal activities. These kabukimano, often armed with swords, instilled fear through their violent acts, forming close-knit clans under the banner of loyalty to the shogun. Another theory proposes the Yakuza's connection to the makiyako, self-proclaimed defenders of the oppressed, contrasting with the kabukimano's brutality. Despite this, establishing a direct link between the Yakuza and makiyako remains challenging. Two additional theories point to the Bakuto and Takiya origins. The Bakuto, itinerant gamblers organizing illicit gambling gatherings, may have contributed to the term Yakuza, derived from a card game's worst score. Meanwhile, the Takiya, roving merchants engaged in scams, had hierarchical structures resembling modern Yakuza organizations. These diverse theories underscore the enigmatic nature of the Yakuza's beginnings each offering unique insights into their evolution. Yet the precise origins of this infamous criminal syndicate continue to elude historical consensus, leaving their genesis a subject of speculation and intrigue. In the Japanese card game Oicho, players aim to achieve a total score as close to nine as possible. Each player is dealt three cards and their combined values determine their score. However, if a player's cards add up to 20, it's considered the worst possible outcome. This unfortunate combination is formed by drawing the cards 8, 9, and 3, pronounced as Yakuza in Japanese. Here, Ya represents 8, Ku stands for 9, and Za is a variation of San, meaning 3. Originally, Yakuza referred to useless things, but it eventually came to denote the players themselves, particularly the losers. Meanwhile, the Tekia, itinerant merchants notorious for their scams, operated under a strict hierarchical structure akin to the modern Yakuza. This hierarchy mirrored the Oyabun Koban relationship deeply rooted in Japanese culture. In this system, the Oyaban, or parent, assumes the role of the chief while the Koban, or child, serves as the protege. The Koban offers unwavering loyalty and support to the Oyaban, who, in turn, provides guidance, protection, and assistance. This relationship, reminiscent of traditional Japanese mentorship dynamics, forms the foundation of Yakuza organization, setting them apart from the Italian mafia and other criminal groups. 
In contrast to American criminal groups, where small bosses often betray their superiors to gain power, loyalty within the Yakuza is deeply ingrained. Koban, or protégés, display unwavering devotion to their Oyabun, or leaders, even risking their lives to protect them. In instances of Oyabun committing crimes, Koban willingly accept punishment, sometimes even serving prison time in their place. Despite evolving dynamics, an enduring adage among the Yakuza emphasizes unquestioning obedience to the leader's words, no matter how absurd. Climbing the ranks within the Yakuza hierarchy is a challenging journey for humble Kobun. Tasks assigned to them, such as polishing dice, running errands, or even babysitting, reflect their subordinate position within the organization. Tattooing holds significant cultural and symbolic importance within Yakuza tradition. Originally used as a punishment by Japanese authorities to mark outlaws, tattoos have evolved into intricate designs depicting gods, folk heroes, and animals. These tattoos, often covering the entire body, serve as a symbol of belonging, strength, and resilience among Yakuza members. Additionally, tattoos represent a rejection of societal norms, serving as a visual expression of marginality and defiance. Tattooing techniques vary among Yakuza members, with some adhering to traditional methods, earning them greater respect within the Japanese underworld. Interestingly, the association between tattoos and the Yakuza has led Japanese saunas and public baths to display signs prohibiting entry to individuals with tattoos, aiming to safeguard their clientele. However, tattoos are not the only distinctive feature of the Yakuza. They are also known for a more drastic practice, finger amputation. This practice is deeply rooted in the rules governing the Yakuza and their initiation ceremonies for new members. During the initiation ceremony, held on an auspicious day, all members gather as rice, fish, and salt are placed in the alcove of a Shinto shrine. The Oyaban and Koban sit face to face while members act as intermediaries, serving fish and sake to symbolize the blood bond. The Koban is solemnly warned of their future duties, emphasizing unwavering loyalty to the family and Oyaban, even at the expense of personal sacrifice. In addition to initiation rites, the Takiya and Bakuto have their own codes of conduct, emphasizing secrecy and strict obedience to the Oyaban Koban system. These rituals and rules underscore the hierarchical structure and deep seated traditions within the Yakuza organization. Until today, the Yakuza have upheld a strict code of honor, drawing inspiration from the traditional Japanese chivalric code. This code dictates several principles, including refraining from harming innocent citizens avoiding adultery with a friend's spouse, abstaining from theft within the clan, eschewing drug use, and demonstrating respect and obedience towards the clan leader. Members are also expected to be willing to sacrifice their lives and freedom for the leader, maintain secrecy about the organization's affairs, and refrain from killing civilians. Violations of these rules were met with severe punishment, as cowardice, disobedience, and divulging secrets were considered betrayals that tarnished the clan's reputation and honor. The most severe penalty, aside from death, was expulsion from the ranks. Upon expulsion, the Oyabun would inform other clans of the members' status, effectively preventing them from joining any other gang. For less severe offenses, not warranting death or expulsion, the Ubatsumi ritual was employed. This custom, introduced by the Bakuto, involved ceremonially cutting off the upper joint of the little finger. The purpose of this ritual was twofold. It physically weakened the victim's hand, impairing their ability to grip a sword firmly, and it further solidified the Koban's dependence on the protection of their Oyaban. When a Koban underwent this ritual as an act of repentance, the severed phalanx was carefully wrapped in a thin cloth and handled with solemnity. The severed phalanx was handed over to the Oyaban, who typically accepted it, signifying the member's repentance. In cases of repeat offenses, further amputations could occur, either at the second joint of the same finger or at the upper joint of another finger. The Ubitsumi served as a warning before the eventual expulsion of the member, a practice that later spread to other criminal groups like the Takiya. Beyond these practices, both the Bakuto and the Takiya were notable for their close ties with the police, 
being among the first Japanese criminals capable of cooperation with authorities. This collaboration facilitated the consolidation and expansion of their influence and marked the onset of political corruption that would penetrate the highest echelons of the Japanese government during Emperor Meiji's reign from 1868. As Japan experienced its first economic boom in the late 19th century, breaking free from feudal constraints and transitioning into an industrial powerhouse, the Yakuza seized opportunities for further expansion. Some Yakuza organizations began paying bribes to the police, a practice that endured for generations. In this new industrialized Japan, the Yakuza recognized the need to modernize and saw political involvement as essential. Entering politics was not without its challenges, yet the Yakuza and politicians shared a common bond rooted in conservatism, making the transition smoother than anticipated. This intersection between organized crime and political conservatism would shape Japan's socio-political landscape for decades to come. A man who epitomized the fusion of Yakuza and political interests was Mitsuru Toyama, an ultranationalist deeply enamored with the samurai tradition from a young age. Toyama's foray into politics began in his early 20s, when he participated in one of the final samurai uprisings against Meiji authority resulting in a three-year prison sentence. Disillusioned with the Meiji era's emphasis on economic and cultural modernization, Toyama vehemently opposed these changes upon his release. Upon regaining freedom, Toyama swiftly aligned himself with the burgeoning nationalist movement, rallying supporters, including some Yakuza members, whom he viewed as formidable allies adept at quelling social unrest and eliminating left-wing political adversaries, Toyama's charismatic leadership quickly propelled him to national prominence, earning him a Robin Hood-esque reputation as a champion of the people and garnering approval from segments of the Japanese political establishment. Toyama's political convictions would profoundly impact both Japan's history and the trajectory of the Yakuza. In 1881, he founded the Genyosha, or Dark Ocean Society, a nationalist federation serving as a precursor to clandestine societies and patriotic groups. The Genyosha attracted numerous former members of the Takiya and Bakuto, solidifying its status as a pivotal force shaping Japan's socio-political landscape. By the end of the 19th century, ultranationalism became a defining feature of Japan's political landscape a terrain seamlessly integrated with the Yakuza's alliance with politicians. It was during the early 20th century that numerous Yakuza factions began to emerge, including one originating in Kobe, the Yamaguchi Gumi, presently the largest Yakuza family. Established in the early 1930s, the Yamaguchi Gumi swiftly eliminated its rivals, ascending to the summit of Japan's underworld. This ascent was largely orchestrated by Kazuo Tauka, the renowned godfather of Japanese organized crime, celebrated for his ruthlessness and organizational acumen. Under Taoka's leadership, the Yamaguchi Gumi burgeoned into a formidable syndicate, boasting nearly 13,000 members across 36 of Japan's 47 prefectures, wielding significant criminal influence. However, the nation's attention soon shifted to a graver matter, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and Japan's subsequent entry into World War II. The conflict, marked by devastating losses, including millions of soldiers on the battlefronts, two atomic bombings, and Soviet invasion, inflicted a profound humiliation upon Japan. Ultimately, Japan capitulated on September 2, 1945, ushering in a period of American occupation. This defeat heralded a new era, fraught with challenges for the Japanese populace. During the occupation era, Japan faced severe shortages, particularly in food. Paradoxically, the populace found a lifeline in the emergence of the black market, facilitated by the Yakuza. Deeply rooted in their homeland, the Yakuza even traded their weapons for tools to aid in the country's reconstruction efforts. This assistance endeared them to Japanese citizens who felt indebted to their benefactors. However, by the late 1940s, the American occupying forces hinted at eliminating the Yakuza, a contradictory stance given their assistance during the occupation, particularly in supplying rice for the black market. In reality, 
American policy during the occupation was marred by contradictions. General MacArthur and the authorities knew of the Yakuza's influence but prioritized containing the perceived threat of communism. Thus, they viewed the Japanese ultranationalist underworld as potential allies in their anti-communist agenda. This period marked the rise of another influential figure, Yoshio Kodama, who would leave an indelible mark on post-war Japan and the Yakuza. Like Toyama before him, Kodama forged alliances between gangsters and politicians. He founded the Independent Youth Society in 1933, primarily aimed at eliminating certain Japanese politicians. After World War II, Kodama was imprisoned as a Class A war criminal, but was released in 1948. He utilized his amassed fortune from smuggling operations for political purposes, suppressing social conflicts and combating communism in Japan. Kodama's reach extended to cooperation with American intelligence services, particularly the CIA, marking the beginning of a long and clandestine partnership. In the 1950s and 1960s, the CIA covertly funded Japanese nationalists to combat communism in Asia, indirectly benefiting the Yakuza allies of far-right politicians. This cooperation included substantial financial support to the Japanese Liberal Democratic Party, solidifying the conservative right's hold on the country. Thanks to Kodama's influence, the Yakuza wielded significant power in post-war Japanese politics. Their alliance with ultra-nationalist politicians elevated their influence to unprecedented levels. Ultimately, the American occupation proved to be a windfall for the Yakuza, enabling them to thrive politically and economically across the nation. However, their golden age was yet to come. The 1950s heralded a period of profound transformation for Japan, gradually recovering its industrial might and emerging from the aftermath of World War II, the country experienced a resurgence. The signing of the San Francisco Peace Treaty in April 1952 formally marked the end of the American occupation, restoring Japan's sovereignty and allowing it to refocus on its own interests. The post-occupation years witnessed Japan's remarkable ascent, culminating in its rise as the world's third largest economic power by 1968. However, this rapid reconstruction posed challenges for the Yakuza. With food supplies becoming plentiful and the black market diminishing, they were compelled to diversify their illicit activities. This led them to venture into industries such as prostitution, gambling, entertainment, and notably, drug trafficking. Interestingly, during World War II, the Japanese military, like others at the time, provided methamphetamine to soldiers to alleviate fear and fatigue during combat. This drug, produced in abundance, found its way into civilian use, including infamous cases of suicide. In the aftermath of World War II, there were substantial stockpiles of methamphetamine left over, which the Yakuza seized as an opportunity. They distributed this drug widely across Japan, contributing to their prosperity. Alongside drug trafficking, prostitution, and entertainment, extortion remained a key revenue stream for the Japanese underworld during the 1950s. Through these various enterprises, Yakuza organizations experienced significant growth, accumulating vast wealth. During this era, the Yakuza also adopted elements of American gangster culture, influenced by the emergence of Hollywood cinema in Japan during and after the occupation. Yakuza members began dressing in dark suits, ties, white shirts, and sunglasses, emulating their American counterparts. Additionally, Yakuza bosses favored large American sedans, reflecting their newfound style and status. The 1950s witnessed a remarkable increase in the number of Yakuza gangs. By 1958, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police estimated there were around 70,000 Yakuza members in Japan. Just five years later, this number skyrocketed to 184,000, surpassing the size of the entire Japanese army at the time. In the subsequent decades, two prominent Yakuza families emerged as dominant forces, the Yamaguchi Gumi, based in Kobe, and the Inagawa Kai, located in the Tokyo area. Despite these developments, we've yet to delve into Tokyo's role as the capital and its significance in the Yakuza underworld. No single gang has ever managed to achieve a monopoly in the Yakuza underworld. 
However, one organization stood out above the rest, the Inagawa Kai, founded by a prominent Yakuza leader named Kakuji Inagawa. Like Kazuo Taoka, another influential figure, Inagawa exerted considerable influence. By the late 1950s, Taoka's influence had spread nationwide. With nearly 10,000 koban under his control and a criminal network comprising 343 different gangs, Taoka was a formidable force. However, tensions brewed between Taoka and Inagawa, leading to a looming conflict. Surprisingly, the two Yakuza leaders formed an alliance on October 24, 1972, facilitated by their mutual friend, the notorious gangster and politician Yoshio Kodama. Kodama, a key figure in Japanese organized crime during the 1960s, adeptly bridged the gap between the underworld and politics. His alliances further modernized Yakuza gangs, elevating their political power. Kodama's influence extended to the highest echelons of Japanese politics, as he represented some of the largest Yakuza syndicates in the country. With politicians in one hand and a loyal army of gangsters in the other, Kodama wielded immense power. However, his career came to an abrupt end in the late 1970s when he faced charges of tax evasion linked to a major scandal. The scandal originated in 1957 when Lockheed, a renowned American aerospace firm, sought to sell combat aircraft to the Japanese Army. Kodama leveraged his political connections to advance Lockheed's interests, but the scheme involved substantial bribes. The scandal erupted in 1976, sparking outrage among the Japanese populace. Facing trial, Kodama was accused of embezzling $5 million in income taxes between 1972 and 1975 and of acquiring $3.6 million in foreign currency. During his trial, demonstrators gathered at his home intent on holding him accountable for his betrayal. Ultra-nationalist supporters, once his fervent admirers, now called for his suicide, accusing him of dishonoring Japan. They suggested he perform harakiri, a ritual suicide involving disembowelment. The scandal reached such heights that Mitsuyasu Manu, a former actor and ultra-nationalist, attempted to assassinate Kodama by crashing a plane into his home reminiscent of World War II suicide bombers. However, the attack failed, resulting in Manu's instant death. Following the scandal's revelation, Kodama's health rapidly deteriorated, leading to the decline of his empire. He attributed his demise to divine punishment, claiming retribution for his involvement in the Pacific War. Kodama passed away in his sleep from a stroke on January 17, 1984 in Tokyo before the conclusion of his trial. This extensive scandal significantly tarnished the Yakuza's image among the Japanese populace, eroding the gratitude they once held for the organization. However, despite the negative publicity, the power of the Japanese underworld remained largely intact. Kazuo Taoka, the leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi, with nearly 120,000 members under his command, maintained considerable influence. Unlike Kodama, Tauka preferred to operate in the shadows to avoid public scrutiny. Nonetheless, his reign faced a significant challenge due to internal gang rivalry. In July 1978, Tauka survived an assassination attempt by a young Yakuza from the Matsuda Gumi clan, a rival of the Yamaguchi Gumi. This incident triggered a violent gang war reminiscent of 1930s Chicago. Retaliatory attacks claimed the lives of five Matsuda Gumi members, while Tauka struggled to recover from his injuries. The assassination attempt left him weakened, signaling the beginning of the end for his leadership. With Tauka's control waning, internal divisions within the Yamaguchi Gumi began to surface, as lieutenants vied for power and succession. Tauka's reign as the most powerful Yakuza syndicate leader in Japan came to an end in July 1981, with his death from a heart attack. At the time of his passing, the Yamaguchi Gumi alone generated over $460 million annually. Following Tauka's death, more than 1,300 Yakuza members from 200 gangs gathered in Kobe to pay their respects. Fumiko Tauka, his wife, took temporary leadership of the Yamaguchi Gumi, a groundbreaking development in Yakuza history. 
Her role was intended to be interim until a male successor emerged. Initially, Kenichi Yamamoto, founder of the Yamakin Gumi, was poised to assume leadership. However, Yamamoto succumbed to illness seven months after Taoka's demise. Consequently, for a period, nearly 12,000 members of Japan's largest crime syndicate were led by a woman until Masahisa Takanaka was elected as the new godfather in 1984. In the 1980s, the Yamaguchi Gumi and the Inagawa Kai remained prominent Yakuza families, alongside another notable syndicate, the Sumiyoshi Kai. Unlike other Yakuza groups, the Sumiyoshi Kai operated without an Oyabun or supreme leader, relying on a system of multiple equal heads. This structure allowed for greater autonomy among gang members. By the mid-1980s, the Sumiyoshi Kai was generating over $276 million annually. During this period, the relationship between law enforcement and the Yakuza was characterized by widespread corruption and cooperation. Police often conducted raids on the underworld, but gangsters were frequently released due to insufficient evidence. Furthermore, Yakuza were typically forewarned about impending police actions, enabling them to evade capture. Despite this, there was a level of mutual respect and understanding between Yakuza and police, with both sharing conservative and nationalist values. Some Yakuza even assisted police in resolving societal conflicts, highlighting the complex and symbiotic relationship between the two groups. In early 1983, a scandal rocked Japan as the press uncovered police collusion with the Yakuza. Reports revealed that some officers had accepted bribes of up to $20,000 to overlook crimes committed by gangsters. To salvage their reputation, authorities took action resulting in the dismissal or discipline of 124 police officers, a significant number considering it could provide security for a city of nearly 70,000 people. However, the late 1980s marked the peak of Yakuza prosperity amidst Japan's extraordinary economic growth. From 1986 to 1990, the Japanese economy experienced unprecedented expansion, with Tokyo becoming the world's largest stock exchange and real estate values surpassing those of the entire United States. Seizing the opportunity, Yakuza invested heavily in real estate and the booming stock market reaping immense profits across various industries like construction and entertainment. At the forefront of this era was Susumu Ishii, the new leader of the Inagawa Kai Syndicate in Tokyo. Ishii, unlike his predecessors, adopted a more refined and discreet approach, accumulating a staggering fortune exceeding $1.6 billion by 1988. Under his leadership, Inagawa Kai became Tokyo's largest crime syndicate, engaging in drug trafficking, extortion, gambling, and other illicit activities. However, the economic bubble eventually burst in the early 1990s, triggering one of Japan's worst crises in decades. Ishii's empire crumbled, exacerbated by declining health, leading to his retirement in October 1990 and subsequent death a year later. The economic downturn exposed widespread corruption and scandals within the Yakuza, prompting the Japanese government to enact stricter measures. On March 1, 1992, Japan passed an anti-gang law, officially designating the Yakuza as a social menace and implementing special measures to curb their activities. Despite initial resistance, the Yakuza faced increased scrutiny and pressure from law enforcement, marking a significant turning point in their history. The police claimed that thousands of gangsters had ceased their activities and dozens of criminal groups had dissolved following the implementation of the anti-gang law. However, the reality was far from the announced facts. While tens of thousands of gangsters were indeed driven out, most remained loyal to the underworld, simply transitioning into roles as associates to avoid suspicion. Despite this, the law did lead to a reduction in the total number of Yakuza by about 10,000. Although their numbers remained substantial, with nearly 80,000 Yakuza reported in 1994, half of whom were designated as associates. Ultimately, the law drove the Yakuza further underground, making intelligence gathering even more challenging. Some Yakuza leaders even swore to cease all cooperation with authorities. However, this crackdown had another significant consequence. 
the Yakuza began exploring business opportunities overseas. With the decline in easy money and the prosperous years of the bubble, the Yakuza needed to restructure and find new sources of revenue. In the early 1990s, they turned to international trafficking, particularly of women and drugs. Tens of thousands of women across Asia were lured with promises of legitimate jobs and monai, only to be drugged and exploited as sex slaves in Japanese brothels. Moreover, the Yakuza delved into drug trafficking, particularly methamphetamine, which they were already familiar with. They traded these illegal substances internationally, reaping substantial profits. Additionally, they showed interest in heroin and cocaine. There were reports of the Yamaguchi Gumi Syndicate collaborating with the Colombian Cali cartel to bring large quantities of cocaine into Japan, although this threat never materialized. Furthermore, the Yakuza forged deals with the Russian Mafia, leveraging their business acumen and ruthlessness. This collaboration facilitated the resale of stolen cars and consumer goods between Japan and Russia, as well as trafficking in weapons and women. Moreover, ambitious Yakuza members expanded their operations to the United States with sightings in Hawaii and on the mainland in the early 1970s. Despite various international alliances and ventures, the Yakuza's influence and activities continued to evolve, presenting challenges to law enforcement agencies worldwide. The Yakuza had indeed established bases in the United States, particularly in the American Pacific Islands. They expanded their operations to cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. In the early 1980s, local police in New York became aware of the Yakuza's presence and their large-scale criminal activities in the area. However, they seemed unconcerned, stating that in businesses like prostitution, the five families would be interested, implying that dealing with the Mafia was inevitable. Less than a year after this declaration, the New York Mafia surprised everyone by deciding to collaborate with the Yakuza, particularly in organizing clandestine gambling. Despite initial assumptions that the Yakuza wouldn't pose a threat, the American Mafia saw them as an opportunity to expand their business. This collaboration allowed Japanese gangsters to forge alliances with local Mafia groups, benefiting both parties. As the 20th century came to a close, the Yakuza had established themselves in numerous countries, significantly expanding their international activities. While they seemed to be recovering from the financial losses associated with the bursting of the bubble economy, new and more complex challenges awaited them as they entered the new millennium. Ultimately, the Yakuza began to resemble the U.S. Mafia more closely. Traditional values and codes of conduct started to erode, replaced by a focus on violence, profit, and self-interest. Longtime Yakuza leaders expressed concerns about the changing nature of the organization, noting a shift towards more violent and profit-driven behavior among the newer generation of gang members. In the 21st century, the Yakuza underwent a significant transformation, shedding traditional values and adopting a more ruthless and self-serving approach. This marked a departure from their historical roots and fundamentally changed the landscape of Japanese organized crime. The modernization of Yakuza gangs, which began in the aftermath of World War II, continues to evolve shaping the future of the criminal underworld in Japan and beyond. The decline of solidarity and obedience among Yakuza members became increasingly apparent in 1984, as noted by the Tokyo Metropolitan Police. This trend was attributed to several factors, including the retirement of aging gang bosses, who enforced strict discipline and changes in the temperament of younger gangsters, the rise of younger leaders who were less bound by traditional customs, and the passing of the older generation marked a significant shift in the structure of Yakuza gangs. While not all younger Yakuza members were defiant, many viewed ancient customs as hindrances to their activities, prioritizing wealth accumulation and business success instead. Some even broke the code of silence known as omerta by publicly revealing information about their bosses, a practice unheard of in previous years. The evolution of the Yakuza reflects their complex role in Japanese society, oscillating between criminality and heroism, much like the Mafia in Sicily. Over the decades, 
the Japanese have navigated a delicate balance with the underworld, sometimes yielding to its demands to maintain social peace. However, this social contract is now eroding, and the Yakuza face the threat of extinction. With their numbers dwindling and fewer young Japanese joining their ranks, authorities are intensifying efforts to combat their activities and offer avenues for reintegration into society. It's a peculiar fate for a criminal organization that once wielded significant power in the land of the rising sun. As we conclude this discussion on the Yakuza, I hope you've gained valuable insights into their history and societal impact. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more, consider subscribing and enabling notifications. Your support means a lot. Thank you for your time, take care, and see you soon.